Hi children and teachers that will be watching this. This is not an assembly, it's an RE lesson designed for Key Stage 2 children in primary schools. And the subject I've been given to talk about is the Trinity. Christians since about the year 2 or 3 or 400 have talked about the Trinity as a way of talking about God as Father, God as Son, Jesus Christ, and God as the Holy Spirit. Now Tricia put some photographs on at the... Uh, as part of this um, part of this video, you'll see them there, where we had on a stand a kettle representing steam, some ice cubes, which because it's winter they still haven't melted, and some water. I'm just going to start the kettle boiling again so I can get some steam. People who've attempted to talk and explain about the Trinity, particularly to children, have often used, uh, often looked towards examples that would help. And so many people have found it helpful to think about steam. You might just see a bit of steam in the camera here from the kettle. That's one form of water, turn it into steam. And then when you freeze it, it becomes ice. And obviously the thing that we drink and gives us life, water. Another illustration, which I can't illustrate to you before you today because I don't have one, is the violin. If you think about the example I just used, water can be water as a liquid, it can be ice as a solid, and it can be uh, vapour or steam as a sort of uh, gas. Three things but from the same matter. And with a violin, you've got the violin which you play, you've got the bow which helps bring the sound out, and then you've got the person playing it. And these are all very helpful examples. The only thing about examples, though, is they don't really quite do it. Now, one of the most famous paintings in the world, and this has been put to tapestry, is the painting of the Last Supper. And you can see, this has been made in Italy, you can see how this artist has attempted to portray the Lord's Supper in the form of a tapestry. When I go into church, sometimes, particularly uh, during Lent, I will wear a scarf around my neck, a clerical scarf, and you can see there the picture of the cross. So we use symbols all the time in the church. And Trisha's going to put this picture up on the video so you've got it, but I'll just hold it. This is an icon of the Trinity. It's called Rublev's icon of the Trinity. One of the figures represents the Father, one represents the Son, and one represents the Holy Spirit. And one of them is indicating with uh, their hand that there's room for you and me to come in. All these examples are helpful. But let me explain it in another way. When I talk about God, I'm talking about God as a living being. When I talk about Jesus Christ, I'm talking about the very person of Jesus Christ, as we've just remembered, born at Bethlehem, grew up as a man, and then at Easter we remember that he died on the cross. When I talk about the Holy Spirit, I'm not talking about a thing like ice or water, or an object like a violin, because the Holy Spirit in the Bible is someone that you can grieve. I'll never forget, this is my famous sin, that when I was a little boy of eight, seven or eight, I stole some raspberry tarts that my mother had made and left out on a shelf to call. I had grieved her, albeit only temporary, because I'd stolen some bakery things that she had made. She quickly forgave me when I said sorry. But in the Bible it says we can grieve the Holy Spirit. You can only grieve a person, not a thing. The other thing, just to explain this, is this, that right throughout the Bible, it often talks about God in the plural sense. So right at the beginning of the Bible, and because you're Key Stage 2 children, I'm sure you can look this up yourself, in Genesis chapter 1, it says this, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. 
And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And right throughout Genesis chapter 1, it talks about God in the plural. In other words, not just one being, but three in one. Again, of course, because I'm trying to teach something, I'm going to use examples. Like most daddies and mummies, I've got a photograph on my desk of my children when they were younger. So I've got uh, myself with Theo there. Trisha will put these pictures up on the uh, video. And I've got Harriet there. Also on my desk, I've got a lovely photograph of Trisha uh, when she was younger. And that's typical of what people will do. I'm sure your mummies and daddies, or whoever cares for you, will have photographs on your desk. But am I pleased with just loving a photograph? No. I want to be with those people. My children are grown up now, and one of the things I really look forward to is a call from my kids. I still call them kids even though they're grown up. And I love my wife, and I live with her, and therefore I have a relationship with her. When Tricia and I were, were ordained by the Bishop of Chelmsford by a man called John Perry, he once took some time to explain what the Trinity was. And he says the Trinity is God in community, three in one, living together in community. So the Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father, and the Son lives the Spirit, and vice versa. They live in community. Right from the beginning of the New Testament, when people like Paul wrote about God, they did it uh, in this way. Just listen and try and uh, sort of count on your finger when I mention Father, when I mention Son, and when I mention Holy Spirit. This is Romans chapter 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his Son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and through the spirit of holiness was appointed Son of God in power, by his resurrection from the de dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So did you count on your fingers when I mentioned uh, different members of the Trinity? When Jesus sent his disciples out, when he'd been raised from the dead, he said this to his disciples, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So the ice has melted a bit now, which is rather good. When I baptise, when Tricia and I baptise particularly children and babies, but adults as well, we'll make the sign of the cross on their forehead like this. So we'll go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. I'll do that in front of you now. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So right from the time that the church got going, it became a Trinitarian faith talking about God as Father, as Creator, talking about Jesus Christ the Son that was sent and who lived on earth and whom we've got four Gospels about, and then talking about the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of God that was sent to live inside us. This camera that's filming me now won't work without the data stick inside, without the battery inside. And the Holy Spirit in us is the power of God that comes to live in us. As Tricia taught on a video, on this, on this video site about the Lord's Prayer, how do we start the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who is in heaven. So Christians talk about God as Father, they talk about God as Spirit, and they talk about God as Son. It's three persons in, but three persons, but one, it's one God. God is one. Now, hopefully I've not confused you, but made things a little bit clearer. And if I was doing this in class, I would go, why don't we have questions? Some, some of you from one particular school sent in some questions. If people believe that God, um, if people believe 
uh, that God made the world, what about the Big Bang? Well, let me not explain that as well as a scientist would do, but let me have a go. All the churches I've ever been in, I would say about 45% or maybe 40% of the people in them are scientists. When you go to the Department of Physics in Oxford, more than half of the people that teach in the Department of Physics at, at Oxford, I should have said Oxford, Oxford University, are either Christians or Muslims or a member of another world faith. They have a faith. Because there's something logical about science and there's something logical about faith. And the Bible tells us about God's role in making the world, but not how exactly it happened. So whether it was the Big Bang or exactly as Genesis said it is not the key issue. The key issue is who created the world and Christians believe that God created the world. Another question, which is rather fun, is if God made me, what about my parents? Something that Tricia has been putting in, into her services is God is supernatural, the super and the natural. The natural bit, and obviously you will learn this in school, that to have a baby, you need a man and a woman, a mummy and a daddy, to actually make that child appear in the world. But that wouldn't happen without God's creative uh, power being there. And I'm thankful that God created my father and my mother and my grandparents and my brothers and sisters and he created me. In Psalm 139, it says, How marvellously I'm made. You saw me when I was formed in my mother's womb. So another question a child asked was this. I thought was God, God was positive. So why does it say he made death a sting? It talks about the sting of death in the Bible. Another difficult question for which there's no easy answers. And by the way, you know, to none of us can 100% understand the Trinity. There's a mystery about it. But what I can say about death is this, is that nowhere in the Bible does it say that death was God's good idea for the world. Death came in as a punishment for sin. It's, and uh, as it were, death is like a sting. You know, if you sting yourself on a nettle, or even worse, if you get bitten by a, a deadly snake, that will hurt you. And death is like that, and we've seen that uh, in recent months. So nowhere in, in the Bible is death seen as something uh, that is good. And yet Christians believe that Jesus conquered death by going through it and rising again on the third day. Uh, the last question is this. Where is the evidence that God exists? Wow, what an amazing question. 10 out of 10 for whoever asked that. Let me try and answer it in this way. When I go out into creation and I see dew on a, a spider's web in the morning, when I go to probably, uh, with my budget, I'll have to go to a zoo rather than fly to South Africa. When I go to a zoo and see a rhinoceros or an elephant or a tiny uh, Mexican bat, or a snake, or uh, you know, whatever animal I see, I'm wowed by the beauty of that animal, or that insect, or that bird. And so, as a Christian, when I see creation, it's a mirror of the majesty of God. In our church, we've got a beautiful stained glass window. It's called the creation window. And when I look at that, it's, it says to me something about the beauty of God. When the church is open again, go and have a look yourself. So creation speaks of God. And then when I read the Bible, which I've read at least about five or six times from the beginning to the end, as I read Holy Scripture, I see God in the Old Testament. I see God in the Gospels. I see God in the letters of St. Paul. And above all, when I became a Christian, I knew in my heart that Jesus had died on the cross for me. And so Christians will often use the symbol of a cross, or maybe a simple one like that, or maybe a crucifix with, as it were, the, uh, a sort of carving of Jesus on it. And every time I look at these, I remember that Jesus died for me, that he rose again, and that his love for me is real. I can't prove it, 
but along with 2.8 billion people in the world, I'm someone who says that I'm a Christian, I follow him, he helps me in my life, doesn't mean that I don't suffer. I had my tooth extracted this week. Do I suffer pain? Yes. But I know that God is with me and as I read about the person of Jesus, that, that convinces me again and again and again that God is real. I can't prove it like I can prove this really is me on this camera, on this film, but my witness, my testimony is that what I say is true and I see it in other people through the acts of kindness that they do. Someone in my church, when they heard that I had my tooth taken out, they sent me a pot of marmalade. Isn't that wonderful? It's like Paddington Bear, it made me happy. And so often it's the acts of kindness that others do to me or, or I hopefully will do to others that convince me that God is real. I'm sure you've got other questions and when I go back to the beginning of what I just said, when I talked about Genesis and God being in there, of course it was the spirit that was hovering over the water, but later on, right through that passage in Genesis, it does talk about God in the plural. It's not just, and in one other part of the Bible, it says, it says, as it were, speaking about Jesus, I was with you at the beginning when the world was made. Tudor's answered the questions, but I thought I'd have a go answering the questions as well. So here we are. If people believe that God made Earth, what about the Big Bang? Now I want to say that uh, the Big Bang is one way of describing how the world came into being. If you listen to David Attenborough uh, on his most recent programme, which is called The Perfect Planet, he talks about this being a planet where everything came together to work as one thing. And it's an amazing thing that we have such intricacies in the world. Every little cell that comes together. And David Attenborough doesn't believe in God. But I would say, and he believes in the Big Bang, but I would say that God was behind the Big Bang and he made a perfect planet. There isn't another one like it. Well, I don't think so. Certainly not in our universe. So God, I believe, can be behind the Big, planet, the big Bang as well. And the question is not how the world was made, because science answers that. But religion answers, why was the world made? The second question is, if God made us, what about our parents? And God made me and he made you, but you are made through the relationship of your parents, one with the other. And you are made like You've got a bit of your dad and a bit of your mum and probably a bit of your granddad and a bit of your grandmum and your brothers and sisters might be a little bit similar to you. But you are unique and God made you unique. You're the only one of you and he made you and something one of my favourite phrases is God doesn't make rubbish. Every single person that God makes is special. Then the next question. I thought God was positive. Uh, uh, but, the, but what about death? And the thing about death is that death is not good. And every time Jesus encountered death, he was sad. He was angry that people died. And I know that when we lose people who mean a lot to us, or even if we lose a pet, sometimes we feel angry. It's not fair that they died. And that's what Jesus felt. Jesus the went. world was not created with death in it. The world was created as a place of life. But death came into being and it has a sting and it's horrible. But it's what Jesus did on the cross was to overcome death. 
and to stop death as being the end and to create something beyond death, something more than death. And the last question is, what is the evidence that God exists? And I would say that it's hard to find proof. We can't prove that God exists. We can prove that you exist. If we pinch you, you might jump. Oh! <laughs> but we can't prove that you that God exists. There's quite a lot of proof that Jesus existed as a man walking on earth. And that's not just Christians who will tell you that. That's history books that will tell you that Jesus existed as a man. But what about God? Well, the thing about knowing whether God exists or not is that it is faith. But faith isn't blind. It's about relationship, as Tudor spoke about. And I had an experience when I was uh, in my late teens. I was an au pair before there were mobile phones. And I phoned my mum twice in a year. That was all I could afford. It was so expensive to phone somebody in a different country. And I knew when I spoke to her that even though I couldn't see her, she was really there. And I realised that that was the same as my relationship with God. I couldn't see him, but I know his love. And that's the same today. I hope those answers have been helpful. They're not the same as Tudor's, but they're answers to the same questions.